So what is it that Jude and Second Peter are trying to tell us? Something you'll never hear in church. You're going to hear right now. That these two books actually tell you something very shocking that your pastor doesn't see. Okay? It's something if you look back and you look it over and analyze it, you'll see it and you'll be like, wow. Okay, now, Jude. Let me just show you what he's trying to do here. It's nothing that you've been taught. Okay, it has to do with something pretty relevant, too. It has to do with the pseudepigraphial and apocryphal books. The books that your pastor tells you are falsely attributed and bad. Okay? It tells you they're not part of the Bible canon. But actually, that's not what Jude and Second Peter say. Let me just show you what's going on here. Jude 1.3 Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay, so he's talking about contending for the faith. This is the first thing he starts off after his greeting, he says this. Okay, now then it says in verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now by lasciviousness, if you have a standard Protestant understanding, you're going to think that has something to do with sensuality or pleasure or something like that. But in reality, what the term says in the ancient Greek is that they're lawless. Okay, And there actually is a very strong theology taught in the Protestant church that is lawless, that tells you, all you need is faith. You don't need to repent of your sins. Just take Jesus as your Savior. You don't need Him as your Lord. They won't tell you you don't need Him as your Lord. But it's not required. You don't need to have Him as your Lord. This is turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And these are the very same people who removed or said that these books are not part of the canon. They proudly proclaim sola scriptura, but then they forget there's a bunch of books that they removed. Or actually the, that certain Jews removed in AD 90, and then they just followed suit in around 354 AD onward. Okay. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now Egypt, Egypt is spiritually where Jesus was crucified. Let me show you something. A lot of people, when they read Egypt, they're like, they don't understand the symbology. What he's referring to here is that when they were in the land of Egypt, they were spiritually led astray. And that's used symbolically in the New Testament. For example, Revelation, let me show you here. Revelation 11, verse 7 through 8, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, we're going to talk about the bottomless pit in a minute here. Shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our, also our Lord was crucified. Well, where was Jesus crucified? Was he crucified in Sodom or Egypt? It says spiritually called. That great city. What great city might that be? Jerusalem? Yeah. Okay, so, we know that when he's talking about Egypt and Sodom, because, matter of fact, the very next verse, uh, actually, a verse after that, let's, uh, again, verse 5 through 7 here, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains of under darkness unto that judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, uh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now let me just go through all these verses I just read to you. I just indicated how Egypt and Sodom spiritually are referring to those who are unregenerate, who are wicked and who have rejected God, who knew God and rejected him. This is what it's referring to. So it's referring to the church here. It's referring to people who are, are, are in the church but not of the church. Okay, because he says in verse 3, 
to contend for the faith. Okay? Gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation was needful for me to blow out, that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was delivered unto the saints. Okay, just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees were against Judaism. They were against their own religion. And they were fighting against Jesus. They also removed certain books in the Council of Jamnia. Okay, so in other words, they didn't accept all the canon of their own canon. And they went against their own canon. Okay, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit here. But um, as I was reading, it says that angels which had kept not their former first estate, but left their own habitation, meaning, meaning the, the realm that they were living in. They, they came from the heavenly realms and came down on Mount Hermon, 200 of them, according to the book of Enoch. Now, how do we know he's referring to the book of Enoch here? Well, later on he, taught, he, he quotes the book of Enoch in verse 14, but another thing that also indicates he's referring to the book of Enoch here is the fact that he says, he ha uh, the rest of verse 6, it says, He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. These, the, the term chains, angels being in chains, that's nowhere found in the accepted canon among Protestants, the 39 books. There is nothing that says anything about angels being in chains. The only book that says anything about angels being in chains is the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch. So he's actually talking about something he read in the book of Enoch. And he also quotes the book of Enoch later on in this chapter. Remember, this is only a one-chapter book. And as you can see, there's a lot to be said if you understand what's really being said. Okay, so... So he says they're in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of that great day. Now, now you might not have not, not noticed a contradiction here. Everlasting chains unto the judgment of that great day? That right there shows you sort of the thing I've been discussing in other videos about aeonos not meaning eternity or everlasting as everybody claims it means because every time it's used, it's always got a time limit on it. Until the judgment of that great day. It didn't say forever. You see what I mean? Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. What does it mean by strange flesh? Are set forth for an example, suffering a vengeance of eternal fire. Now, a lot of people don't understand this because things have been substituted. Certain theologies have substituted and changed what God's word means. Strange flesh. It means... Something that has to do with idolatry or it has to do with going after uh, another species of flesh. Okay, and, and what did they try to do? They tried to rape angels. Okay, now usually when it says a strange woman in the Old Testament, it's referring to a woman of another nation who worships a different God. In other words, it has everything to do with idolatry. It has everything to do with rebellion. So going after strange flesh, when it says strange flesh there, it's referring to either idolatrous sexual practices or it's referring to the fact that they were trying to rape angels which is another species okay now the word fornication doesn't mean sex before marriage the term pornea there uh it means idolatry and prostitution the 17th century meaning in english of the term fornication meant idolatry and prostitution but of course they've changed the meaning of the word over the centuries yet they haven't actually, and why does that happen? Because of theology, because of bad theology, because of man's theology, okay? Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Defile the flesh, you know, and that's kind of going back to what I was just saying. You know, uh, in Romans 1, for example, a lot of this stuff, people read through Protestant eyes through the theology of today, the 21st century theology, and when you start really researching things, things start falling apart real quick. And you start to realize what's really going on, especially if you start reading the ancient Greek, the early church fathers, you start reading a lot of the, the, the books that have been rejected, uh, which the Bible tells you are highly revered, and go look at these books, like the Book of Jasher, Book of Jubilees, and et cetera, et cetera, or Book of Enoch in this example. Uh, the thing is, is that defile the flesh, you know, against nature, defile the flesh, this, this has to do, uh, first and foremost, with uh, breeding with another species, like having sex with animals or sex with angels, okay? Because the first sin of the fallen angels was in the book of Enoch, where angels came down and mated with humans, and, and some say they raped women, 
and had giant Nephilim children, which is clearly indicated if you look at the ancient Hebrew and Greek in Genesis, depending if you use the Septuagint or Hebrew Masoretic or uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the point is, is that if you look at it in context and you go compare it to uh, other texts, like the Book of Jubilees, you can see it's quite clear what's being said. The Book of Jubilees makes it even more clear what's being said. You know, when it says the, the, the whole world had been corrupted, it means genetically corrupted. Because they were basically genet genetically altering humans, genetically altering animals. And, and it says that was the days of Noah. So what did Jesus say? As in the days of Noah shall it be in the end times. Okay, and what are we doing today? They're making genetic hybrids of things. Scientists are doing it. And then also it says as, uh, that this book of Enoch won't be revealed until the re a remote generation, which would be the final or, final or near the final generation, which is when it was rediscovered from Ethiopia, the only place that, had, that Rome didn't have its palms on was Ethiopia. That was about one of the few places where Rome couldn't grasp it and, and control it. So I'm kind of going all over the place here. But uh, So defile the flesh is referring first and foremost to idolatry, rebellion against God. It's referring to uh, trying to have sex with another species. It's also referring to, uh, you know, other types of fleshly sins, of course, but uh, often the, the long, you know, lists that pastors come up with are just ridiculous, and they're not even scriptural. They just make up stuff and just add it, pretty much, as far as I'm concerned. And they, they go off terminology that's been misunderstood and mistranslated over the years. Like I said, the term fornication changed its meaning. So, you know, today, when someone sees defile the flesh, they think, oh, masturbation or something silly like that. But, you know, we're, we're talking about Scripture upon scripture, ancient meanings upon ancient meanings. The meanings don't change. It's just people don't know what these things mean anymore. Uh, and let's go on to number verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now what is this from? Okay, this is actually, this verse has actually got a sw small quote from the Assumption of Moses, also called the Testament of Moses. So, and why did Michael do this? So in other words, we have here already Jude quoting the Assumption of Moses, talking about a, a, a story, a situation in the Assumption of Moses. And we have earlier where we know he is talking about something he read in the Book of Enoch, and we know later on in verse 14 he, he quotes the Book of Enoch. Okay, so he's quoting all these books, that are in the Apocrypha, that are in the Pseudepigraphia. The Pseudepigraphia is, what it means is falsely attributed works. In other words, church scholars tell us that the book of Enoch wasn't written by Enoch, that the Assumption of Moses wasn't written by Moses. But Jude is telling us, no, that's not true. Enoch wrote the book of Enoch. Moses wrote the Assumption of Moses. That's what Jude is actually saying here. He's saying that these guys are full of shit. That's what he's really saying. And why is this relevant? Because he's telling us in the beginning to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto us. And then he tells us down here at the bottom, uh, but ye, uh, okay, but beloved, remember ye the words which are spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you that you should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own godly lusts. The term lust there means de desire. And I, I'm not trying to get into a bunch of different things here, but the term lust, whenever... It's so funny how they translate this word. It's the same word as desire. It's used for good and bad desires. But whenever it shows a bad desire, they put the word lust. Whenever it shows a good desire, they put the word desire. Whenever you see the word lust, you think something sensual or sexual or something like that, but it has nothing to do with it. It's just ungodly, lust, ungodly desires. Any kind of desire. You want to go kill somebody, that's an ungodly lust. You want to go rob somebody, that's an ungodly lust. You want to go rule the world and oppress people, that's an ungodly lust. Anything that's wrong is an ungodly desire. That's what it's saying. I just want to make that clear because then, then you don't get confused. Because, I mean, a lot of these Bible translators are translated uh, basically in a confusing manner. Um, and as a matter of fact, the verse, next verse says, These be the, they who separate themselves sensual, Having not the spirit. Now the term sensual there is not really a good translation because of how people think of the word sensual. Um, 
basically selfish. Uh, if you look at the at the meaning of the Greek word there, it, it says breath. Like, you know, you got your spirit, like God breathed into the body and it had a spirit and it became animated and it's alive. That's the word, okay? But there's a lot of theology that goes with that word. And I think the term sensual has changed its meaning over time. Now it just means something like, ooh, pleasurable or some bullshit like that. But in reality, what it's really saying is selfish. You have your own spirit. You're, you're sort of like a, a rebellious spirit. Like you're, you're your own person. I'm my own God kind of attitude. These be they who separate themselves selfish, not having God's Holy Spirit. That's basically what it's saying. So, but believe, beloved, remember these words which are spoken before the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, there should be mockers in the last time who will walk after their own ungodly desires, and they separate themselves and they're selfish. Is there anybody in the church that's selfish? Because this book is written to people in the church. It's not written to unbelievers. You understand this. And he's quoting books from the Pseudo-Brugafio, which is said to be falsely attributed. In other words, these church scholars were not following God, and they, told, they declared that these books are not of God, and Jude is saying, no, you're wrong. Be careful for, of people like this telling you that these books aren't of God. You see that? And he's telling you to, to make sure you preserve yourself in the faith. It's kind of ironic how the apostles and the disciples, and the apostles and those who wrote the Gospels, they are quoting from the Septuagint. In the New Testament, it's very obvious. Just go look at some of the quotes of the of the Old Testament in the New Testament in the Greek, and notice that they're direct quotes from the Greek Septuagint. And then you'll notice when you go look in the Old Testament of your Bible, it's worded different. It doesn't sound the same. That the 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 prophecy that's quoted in the New Testament, and you go look at it in the Old Testament, it doesn't even look the same. It's because your Old Testament is based off the Hebrew Masoretic text. Your New Testament has Old Testament quotes from the Greek Septuagint. Now, the Greek Septuagint has the Apocrypha in it. Jesus was familiar with the Septuagint. It had already been around for like 200 plus years when he was walking the earth. He was well familiar with the Greek Septuagint. The apostles are quoting it in the New Testament. They're telling you when they quote the Greek Septuagint, they're telling you, we accept the books in the Greek Septuagint. I mean, why else would they be using it? And guess what? It has books in it that are not in your Old Testament. Your Old Testament is the Hebrew Masoretic, which had books removed from it. As a matter of fact, the King James Bible used to have the Apocrypha in it. 200 years ago, when the settlers came to America, they had the Apocrypha in their King James Bible. Today, your King James Bible doesn't have an Apocrypha in it. And that, doesn't that kind of bother you? Why is it they removed it? It's because people are ungodly. This is why. They're ungodly. And they're selfish. And what is the theology of a lot of these people who say sola scriptura and they don't accept the Apocrypha? They believe that you just need to have faith. And, that, and by, by faith, they mean literally nothing. They mean, I can sin in word, thought, and deed all day long. I can do whatever the hell I want to do. And Jesus is going to save me anyways. Isn't that the same as being selfish? Saying I can do whatever I want, anytime I want. Jesus still has to save me. Isn't that the same thing? It is the same thing, because it's not the gospel. <laughs> That's the point. The word faith means faithfulness. It doesn't mean mere belief. Okay? You're faithful to Christ. You're married to Christ. You don't go around whoring yourself out to other gods. This is the spiritual Sodom, the spiritual Egypt that he's referring to here in this book. You're surprised in getting all the stuff out of one little chapter, aren't you? Okay, so, he's quoting the Assumption of Moses. He's quoting the book of Enoch. Now, he goes on after reading the Assumption, of, or talking about the Assumption of Moses. Actually, I wanted to mention something. Michael the Archangel, <clears throat> when contending with the devil, he didn't bring a railing accusation against the devil. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Why did he do that? I think it's mainly, I, I think the theory behind it is that uh, the devil at one time had a position that was very high in God's kingdom before he fell. And I think Michael the Archangel was underneath the devil when the devil wasn't evil and when the devil was part of God's kingdom. Like positional, like military position. So I think Michael was actually, the Archangel was actually uh, revering the position that he once held, not revering the devil, but revering the position. 
that God created. So God put him in a position at one time, and, that, and then he fell from that position. And Michael, out of respect for the position, it's kind of like me respecting the presidential office, but not necessarily respecting the president, you know, kind of like that. That's kind of what I'm thinking is going on there. Uh, verse 10, But these speak evil of these, those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Notice how it says, they know naturally as brute beasts. Okay, this is, this is the theology behind the flesh and the spirit. People think it's literally talking about your flesh. Like as if my physical body is an evil thing and my spirit is somehow good. And I just did a video recently about how, well, don't, don't you recall, Jesus casted evil spirits out of people. Obviously, spirits are not always good. There's evil spirits, <laughs> okay? It's not about spirits being good and your body being bad or something. What it is is your, your body, I, the way I look at it is this way. It's, it's a lower and higher nature, okay? It's what it's really saying is you have a lower and higher nature. Now, your physical body, I think, is weaker than your spirit, okay? It's kind of like Jesus said when you're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I think everything starts in your mind. Your mind controls your spirit, which controls your body. So your body is the last thing of the, of the three, so your mind, spirit, body. Now, the weakest of the three would be the last in the, in the line. You know, it would be your body. Okay, you see what I'm getting at? But that doesn't mean your body's evil. Because if your mind is evil, your spirit's going to be evil, and your body's going to be evil. But if your mind is good, your spirit's good, and your body's going to be good. See how that makes sense? Now, what I think is they use a concept of the fact that your flesh is weaker than your spirit to say a lower and higher nature, and that, you know... Whenever it says naturally, as brute beasts, it's talking about your lower nature. You know, how you war against the flesh, as, as, as Paul says. So, it's not literally saying your, your flesh is evil, as the Gnostics taught, but it's saying, in, in essence, that your flesh is the weakest of the three members, your mind, body, spirit. And, but any, any one of them can be evil, okay? This, you know, if your mind's evil, your spirit's going to be evil, and your body's going to be evil. So, that's, I, I just wanted to explain that. Uh, verse 11, But woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam, for a reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. So here he is talking about people in the church. Okay, to put this in context, the first beginning of this chapter, in verse 4 it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Crept into what? The church. Okay. And then he's going on and he's, he's comparing them to things in the Old Testament. How, you know, the, the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt, but then they still fell later. So he's saying that the church comes out of the land of Egypt when they, came, when they accept Jesus, but then in the latter times, they start to fall away again. Just like we saw in the Old Testament, you know, first they were saved out of the land of Egypt, but then, then they were just a cesspool after so many, you know, centuries, they eventually were way off track. That's what he's saying about the church here. Okay, and then he talks about Sodom and Egypt and how I, I mentioned how in Revelation, spiritually speaking, Sodom and Egypt was where Jesus was crucified, where the Pharisees were, right? Because Israel had basically went astray. Well, he's saying in a sense, the church is going to do the same thing. And, and then he goes on and says, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, blah, blah, blah. And then, he, and then he goes to the assumption of Moses, starts talking about that. And then he goes and he says, these speak evil of things which they know not. And he's taught, and naturally, as brute beasts, and I was telling about the lower nature. In other words, these church people are carnal. Okay, they're not, they're not of God. Now, carnal, not in the aspect of maybe what you've been taught as carnal, but carnal in the aspect of what the Bible teaches. And then it says here, But woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Well, what did Balaam go after? Money. And what did Cain go after? Well, he killed his brother, right? Because he was mad and angry. So it's kind of like the Pharisees killing Jesus. He, they went after the way of Cain, and they, and they crucified Jesus. Or they went after the heir of Balaam, like, like Judas did, and ran greedily after money. Okay, so he's saying that people in the church are going to go after money, and they're going to actually kill people who are of the true faith, which is what we saw happen in, in Rome, in the Papal Rome, that they killed real Christians, and maybe sometimes it was done for money and glory. You know, and there's people that are on TV preaching the money gospel. That's the exact same error. So it's either money 
It's, it, it appears to be basically they either go after money or they or they just try to kill the person who's trying telling the truth or tr tr telling it God's way. And then it says, and it's describing these people in the church right here. This is all cryptic, symbolic land, language here. Uh, thanks to Robert Farrell, he he's on here. He's if you go to my main YouTube front page on the on the right, you'll notice a a, 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 a YouTube channel called Apocryphal 1970. This guy knows a lot about what I'm going to just tell you right here. He knows a lot about this symbology, and he knows a lot about the Apocrypha Pseudepigraphia, and he goes through a lot of it on his channel. So here's, here's what it says here. Verse 12, these are spots in your feasts of charity. Spots. You know, it says the church is going to be without spot and wrinkle. Spots mean sinful in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. So they don't have fear of, of their sin. So they're doing sin on purpose. It's not like they're accidentally sinning. Clouds, they are without water. What does that mean? Clouds, uh, wherefore we're encompassed by a cloud of witnesses. It's referring to a group of people. They're a group. So there's more than one. Without water, what is the water? Water is the word of God. Water is always used to refer to the word of God. Carried about by winds, of winds. Winds mean uh, carried about by every wind of doctrine. It's referring to they're carried by any careless doctrine that comes along, any new fad doctrine, which you can see happens a lot in the church, can't you? Trees, whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. What does that mean? Well, trees refer to humans. Jesus says there's evil, you're an evil tree or a good tree. Remember? Uh, and you remember the guy who was healed, uh, that Jesus spit on the mud and put it on his eyes? And he said, well, people look like trees. That's actually symbolic of the fact that people are trees in, 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 parable, in parabolic form. So this is actually parabolic terminology here that Jude's using. Uh, trees without fruit, whose fruit withereth without fruit. Uh, as Jesus said, a good tree produces good fruit, an evil tree produces evil fruit. So in other words, Jesus is saying is that they pretend to be Christians, but they have no fruits. And why wouldn't they have fruit? Because they, they, they don't, they're not committed to Christ. They're not Christians. Uh, twice dead. Uh, you know, this is interesting. Twice dead kind of re refers back to the parable of the sower, that they were dead before they became Christians, but then they, they, when, they, when, the, when the seed fell, they had a shallow root, and then they died afterwards as well. So plucked up by the roots. It's referring to they have a, a form of faith, but they don't really have a faith. You see what I mean? Verse 13, raging waves of the sea. See, waves of the sea. Now, sea is a, a people, a gr large group of people. Raging waves, meaning they're making waves in the sea of people. They're, they're influencing people on a large scale. Well, we have a lot of mega pastors saying a lot of bad stuff, don't we? Foaming out their own shame. And a lot of people are on YouTube and other places saying, look at this guy. He can't even preach the gospel on live TV at, on what was it? Larry King Live with uh, Joel Osteen, for example. That, that's a good example right there. Foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars. Okay, now stars, uh, usually that refers to fallen angels or angels in heaven. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure how that relates, but maybe that refers to them somehow having to deal with angels or maybe having their ideas from fallen angels. I don't know. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, the term forever, again, is Ianos, which doesn't mean forever. But this is because of they translated the Bible to fit their theology. I don't want to get in that here. Okay. Uh, verse 14, And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. So here we have Jude quoting Enoch. Jude is quoting Enoch, man. Oh, I thought we were supposed to earnestly contend for the faith, so we shouldn't be reading the book of Enoch because it's a falsely attributed work. According to who? Well, Who's it said all this stuff? Scholars. What kind of scholars? Maybe the scholars that would actually fit the definition of verse 12 and 13 I just read. In other words, they're not Christians. They just say it's not of God, but they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, and it's just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees only accepted 24 books. Now, you might not have heard of this, but according to, I think it's 4th Ezra, that it says there are 70 books that were lear the learned and wise should, should read but that the Pharisees only accepted 24 books. And uh, according to Robert Farrell, he's talking about this. He says what's going on there is the evil people can only accept part of God's word. 
Okay, they can't accept the higher parts of God's word. They just automatically reject it. It's because of their sinful nature. They're not of God. They're carnal. So they can't accept the full canon of Scripture. And this is what's happened in the church. And uh, he was referring to the wheats and the tares. Let me go find it here. Now, this is a parable of Jesus, and it's referring to these false prophets and bad, evil people getting into the church and corrupting it. Uh, Matthew 13, verse 24. Okay? Through 30 or something. Another parable put for, he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while the man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, there then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did the, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From hence then came, hath it tares. He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said, and who would be the enemy? The devil. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that go and gather them up? He, but he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat within them. In other words, if, would Jesus, if God went and, and destroyed all these evil people in the church, it would actually mess up the wheat as well, because some, maybe some people's faith is you know, too intertwined with some of these evil people. They, maybe they, they'd look up to these evil people, and it would make them lose faith. See what I mean? Uh, that's just maybe one way to interpret that. Uh, Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, so you see how that works? So that's in the end times. God allows all these evil people in the church because you might you might accidentally screw up the, the, the wheat if he gets rid of all the evil people in the church because they're so interspersed in there by the devil. So he has to wait until the end times, and then when the final time comes, then it's all revealed and everything's corrected. Okay, so, uh, so you know, and let me look at Second Peter, because I wanted to point out something, that both Jude and Second Peter are saying, look, this apocrypha is scripture, okay? You're going to see it in Second Peter in a second here. Okay, check this out. We're at, for Second Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20, right to the end. It's only verse 20 and 21. So right at the end of chapter 1 of 2 Peter. Here we go. Knowing this, that first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Notice he just said that, right? That was at the end of chapter 1. Chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there will shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, Shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you? Covetousness. Now, you remember I read earlier in Jude, it's either about killing or money. You got Judas and you got the Pharisees. And here we go. They make merchandise of Christians. And through covetousness, love of money, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. What do all these guys on the TV do? They make merchandise of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, Hades, uh, actually the pit, I think in this case it might be Tartarus. I don't know, let me go look. Yeah, actually in this case it's Tartarus. You see, here's the thing with the King James Bible that no one tells you. Uh, they use the same English word, one English word, to translate three different Greek words, which all are referring to different things. <laughs> so... When it says hell, it might be referring to the afterlife. It might be referring to uh, the the Tartarus, the under the the region where the fallen angels were put into chains that Jude's referring to. Uh, you know, it could it could mean anything. We don't even know what it means. You have to, that's what's so ridiculous about these translations sometimes. <clears throat> so in this case, they were cast down to Tartarus. So it's referring to the angels from the Book of Enoch that were cast down to Tartarus for their sin of mating with humans, as seen in Genesis six. And deliver them into chains of darkness. Again, the chains of darkness, which is only referred to in the book of Enoch. So 
this is nothing. This is not something he read from the Old Testament because there's no chains that angels are in anywhere in the Old Testament. It's only in the Book of Enoch you find this. So he read the Book of Enoch, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing into the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. See, this is also a very common thing theme. You'll see this in the Book of Nephtali also. They always mention the sin of the fallen angels, which is seen in the Book of Enoch, and then the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think a lot of the ties have to do with uh, just complete rebellion against God. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah completely rebelled against God's laws. It's kind of, it reminds me kind of of North Korea. North Korea does not acknowledge any God but their own fake, false Kim Jong-il. And then they have all these crazy cockamamie laws and torture and hurt people and put them in gulags. They're just crazy, okay? This is kind of how Sodom and Gomorrah was, actually. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah wouldn't allow... If somebody came into their cities, they would torture them, they would rob them, they would do something to them. They would even laugh at them after they robbed them and stuff. They would laugh at them while they're starving to death. This is how the kind of people they were. They're crazy. Okay, this is, this is totally rejecting God's law. It's totally rejecting God. And, of course... Uh, they were idolatrous as well because it also says they went after strange flesh, which could be referring to them trying to rape angels, or it could be referring to the fact they were probably worshiping idols while doing other crazy stuff. But um, in other words, it is a great sin. Okay, and then delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Yeah, because they were doing a lot of evil stuff. Okay, a lot of evil stuff, raping, killing. <laughs> okay. For that righteous man dwelling among them is seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day. Actually, Lot, Lot's daughter got killed by uh, the Sodomites because she felt compassion for one of the people that was a beggar that got chained up in the city. And what they do is they chain them up until they starve to death. And then when they're dead, they just remove their body. Well, he wouldn't die. And they're like, why is this guy not dying? So apparently what was going on was Lot's daughter was feeling compassion for him and giving him food. And then as a result, she got killed for giving him food. So this is the kind of laws they had. For the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they self-willed. See, by despise government, I think it's referring to despising God's government because... What did the fallen angels do? They, they went against God's laws. And what did Sodom do? They, they totally ignored God's laws. Okay, Presumptuous are they self-willed. Do you remember how I mentioned earlier sensuous meant self-willed or selfish? See? This is, this is why you got to look at the Greek, man. Because a lot of these translations, they, they just, they don't, it, it, part of it's not really the translation, actually. This, this King James Bible, I'm guessing sensual. I haven't looked it up, but I'm guessing the archaic meaning of sensual probably is not the same as today it probably meant selfish you know back then i don't know i'm just guessing because the term fornication completely changed its meaning since the 17th century so maybe when they wrote the king james bible or translated it it was probably more accurate with the english language at that time than the english language today because the english language today has been modified through philosophy and theology and whatever people are thinking okay presumptuous are they self-willed they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. In other words, it's like the devil speaking against God. You know, they're speaking against railing accusations against God, kind of like Goliath did against Israel. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Uh, that might be, that, that sounds like it's, he's, he's talking about Jude here. Because what did Jude say? Uh, that Michael the archangel durst not to bring railing accusation against the devil but said, the Lord rebuke you. Okay, so he's actually talking the exact same as Jude here. He's going through it like Jude did. Okay, the same stuff. And actually, it sounds like it's very similar to Jude, because he says here, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of things that they understand not shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots, they are blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. See, look at this. This is the exact same thing Jude was saying. Look, he says here that they... Okay, it's the exact same thing. Uh, where it just said spots here. Let me find it just a sec. First, he, he, he mentions in Jude about ar the archangel not bringing really accusation against the devil, right? 
And we find the exact same in, in Second Peter too, where I, I read uh, that they didn't make railing accusation. Let me see what verse. Oh yeah, verse eleven. So we have in uh, verse Jude one verse nine. Jude one verse nine correlates perfectly with Second Peter two eleven about not bringing railing accusation. Okay, and then. It says brute beasts. The brute beast one is also here. It's in verse 10 on Jude, and it's on verse 12 in 2 Peter 2 12. And then we have the spots where they say there's spots in the feasts, blemishes, spots like sinful, like we're not supposed to be with spot and wrinkle. That's, and Jesus is going to present us as without spot and wrinkle. Uh, Jude 1 12 said these are spots in your feasts of charity. And then it says in 2 Peter, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. That's verse 13 of 2 Peter 2. So he's talking the exact same here. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart that it have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. In other words, they're always trying to steal someone else's stuff. They're very selfish. Okay, that's what covetousness and adultery are. Adultery is not about sex. It's about stealing your neighbor's wife. Okay? which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray following the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So we, here we have Balaam mentioned here about money, right? And I think it was also mentioned, yeah, it was mentioned in verse 11 on Jude. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam. So it's the exact same, it's like the exact same rundown, same type of stuff being mentioned. But was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. So, we have Peter here, basically, he read the book of Jude, and he's basically agreeing with what Jude said, and he's actually almost repeating, in a sense, the same kind of stuff. These are wells without water. As I mentioned, the water is the word of God, so they don't have the word of God. So who doesn't have the word of God? These are people who are leaders in the church without the word of God. Well, I supposedly everybody has the word of God, right? Well, no, they don't, because they're missing books from their Old Testament. They're missing books, so they are without the water of God. In some respects, in others, they just ignore God's word that are preachers as well. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. So, tempest is a wind. Wind is a doctrine. Clouds being groups, groups of people carried about with every wind of doctrine. To whom is the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Again, forever means ages or age or whatever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Want, I, I think... Um, I don't want to say anything there. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Okay, so they allure with loss. Uh, I mean, can you think of any pastors that do that? I mean, you know, it's your day. It's your life. You know, it, God wants you rich. Or, um, oh, Jesus doesn't care if you sin. It's not about that. You just have to have faith. You don't need to repent of your sins. You don't need to live right. God understands you can't do everything right. And you don't need to live right. You see, that's Calvinism. I mean, we're talking the radio ministries and the TV ministries. I just pretty much covered half the ministries you can find on the radio and TV right there. Half the radio and TV ministries fall into that category right there. Okay? While they promise them liberty. What, what do these people promise them, man? I mean, seriously, liberty. They themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, and the same is brought into bondage. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again tangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after have known it to turn away the holy commandment delivered unto them. Yeah, it makes sense, because Jesus said, uh, those who don't know are punished little, or receive little discipline, and those who know the truth and don't follow it, they are they get a greater punishment or greater discipline. Uh, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that washed her wallowing in the mire. Okay, let me show you something here. He quoted two verses he, he quoted two things here. The dog is turned unto his own vomit again. That is from Proverbs. The sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That is from Akikar. Uh, I'm trying to remember what verse. Let me find here. 
Okay, I wanted to show you these two quotes. Proverbs 26, verse 11. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. So that's what that's what 2 Peter 2, that's where he's quoting from. And the other quote with the, the, with the pig is from Ahikar, uh, chapter 7, verse 27. O oh my son, thou hast been to me like a pig who went into the hot bath with the people of quality. And when it came out of the hot bath, it saw a filthy hole and it went down and wallowed in it. Okay, so this is this is where he actually got that quote from. So this is a book that's that's considered bad or an apocryphal book. Uh, I think it's a pseudo-brigophrio. Let me check here. Yeah, it's included. It's considered sort of an apocryphal book in a sense. It's a, a very ancient book, ancient Middle Eastern wisdom literature. Uh, Ahikar uh, was an Assyrian sage known in the ancient Near East for his outstanding wisdom. The story of Ahikar, also was known as the words of Ahikar have been found in Aramaic papyrus of 500 BC among the ruins of Elephantine. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a book of wisdom, just like the book of Proverbs. Okay, so he's quoting two different books of wisdom. And of course, you've never heard of it, have you? No, I, I hadn't heard of it until I, I read some of this either. So, you know, don't, don't feel bad about it. <laughs> um, so let me get back to the text I was reading. I'm going all over the place here. Okay, yeah, that was the end of chapter 2. Uh, let's see what chapter 3 says at the beginning here. Okay, yeah, yeah, check this out. Okay, so then he says the same thing Jude says again. He says, be mindful of these words. He says, that ye be my own, uh, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both, which I stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance, that ye be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of, the, of us apostles of the Lord and Savior. So, look, Second Peter, he tells you, in chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1, about how God's word is inspired, that no prophecies of a private interpretation. Then he goes through and he starts writing about basically the same exact stuff Jude did. And it's clear that he read the exact same thing and he's basically retelling it in his own manner. And he's referring to uh, the assumption of Moses himself. Uh, in a sense, sort of, in a vague sense, and also the book of Enoch in a vague sense because he, it's clear that he's talking about the same stuff Judas. And then he goes on and he even quotes uh, the Proverbs, and then he quotes Ahikar 7, chapter 7, verse, I, I think it was 27. Uh, I just read it off a minute ago and told you what verse it was. But um, So he's quoting all these, these texts that we don't accept as Scripture anymore. We don't accept them as revered uh, the, the story of Ahikar, uh, the Assumption of Moses, uh, the Book of Enoch. And then he's telling us that we need to be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the Holy Prophets. And of commandment to us, the Apostles and the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that ye shall come the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, their own desires, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That sounds kind of like atheists today. Just that, you know, they believe in uniformitarianism, which means everything stays the same. There's no catastrophes. There's nothing weird happening. They, they deny, you know, Genesis. And there's also preachers that are kind of this way. They believe in evolution. They deny, in a sense, the creation. Um, they're kind of scoffers, walking after their own desires as well. Uh, for they are will, willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished so they don't believe in the flood and so, even some pastors don't believe in the flood today uh, you, see, you see kind of where this is going but then the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved against, unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men but, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord as 1,000 years and 1,000 years is one day. So if you read a lot of the apocryphal books, it talks about this one day as a 1,000 years thing. Life of Adam and Eve, uh, it talks about this. Actually, a lot of them do. A lot of them talk about this one day as a 1,000 years. And from what I understand, based on all these different writings I've read, we're pretty much near the end times. And then there's going to be a 1,000-day Sabbath. 1,000-year Sabbath, I mean. Uh so there's seven days in this week, you know, seven days, right? Each one a thousand years. One day is a thousand years. So we had from now from from the creation until now, uh, it's been almost seven thousand years. It's almost been six thousand years. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I it's kind of hard to calculate exactly, but you know, 
I just put a really big number on it. I just say something like this, between 20 to 500 years. Between 20 years and 500 years, we should be near the end. I don't know what it is exactly, but one of the apocryphal books makes me think it could be as far out as 500 years. But one, a lot of the other ones kind of give you this impression it's going to be real quick. But this is just based on stuff I've read, and I don't, I don't make predictions, and I'm not going to predict when it isn't or is. I'm not retarded like a lot of these people that get on there and they're like, oh, it's going to be this year. Yeah, whatever, dude. Uh, okay, so wh what was my point, though? My point is is that these books, <laughs> they're all quoting books that are not in the canon. They're talking about books not in the canon, and then they're telling you that these were given by these are prophecies and they're given by holy prophets, meaning they're God's word. Well, oh, they're not God's word; they're just prophecies. If you say something stupid like that, you got to understand that Second Peter one, at the end of the chapter, verses twenty and twenty one, are used to claim that the Bible is inspired. That's one of the two verses they use to claim. That the Bible is inspired. I think the other one's Second Timothy three sixteen. Let me go look. Yeah. So uh, the Second Peter one verse twenty to twenty one. That verse is used, and Second Peter three or Second Timothy three sixteen are used to claim that the Bible is inspired. They use these two verses to claim the Bible is inspired. But the funny thing is, Peter is talking about books that are not in the Bible. Doesn't that bother you a little bit? Jude also calls it prophecy when he talks about the Book of Enoch. And it's clear Peter read it because he's talking the same way Jude was, right? So <laughs> uh, we got an issue here. We got books that are, that are that are deemed falsely attributed by the church. Yet these guys are saying basically you need to read these books, and they're saying that these are of God and they're prophecy. Okay, that should bother you a little bit. Okay, it makes you wonder too. You know, it's like the wheat and the tares. You know. The, the, the tares can only accept part of the canon because they're carnal-minded, they're lowly, they're sensual, or whatever the words are, you know. They can't accept the full canon. And, and that's why Jesus spoke in parables is because those who don't... <coughs> Jesus spoke in parables because those who are not really true followers of God, like the Pharisees, are not allowed to understand God's word. Okay? And the Pharisees were the ones who tried to remove, and they did remove, Books from the Septuagint, okay, at the Council of Jamnia in AD 90. Okay, so they removed these books. And um, let me just find something here. I'm going to show you okay, a couple things. First, guess who removed the Book of Enoch from the Bible? Guess who removed it? Guess, guess who declared it evil? <laughs> uh, Council of Laodicea. And around 350, 365 AD, I think 350 something, 365 AD, something like that. Um, at the Council of Laodicea, they wanted to remove revelation from the bible and the book of enoch revelation the reason why they wanted to remove revelation from the bible is because if you recall there's seven churches talked about in revelation in the in the first few chapters there right the worst of the churches referred to in revelation is the count the church of La laodicea there uh he says that he wants to spit them out of their mouth his mouth right okay so that's the that's that church was in Laodicea, and the Council of Laodicea wanted to remove Revelation because it condemned them. Is that a good reason to, to want to remove a book from the Bible is because it condemns you? They wanted to remove the book of Revelation, but they weren't able to. But they were able to remove the book of Enoch. Isn't that so nice of them to remove the book of Enoch, but they couldn't get the Revelation removed? So do you really want to trust a council that wanted to remove a book that, that, can, that Jesus condemned them? Would you want to trust a, 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 a council that did something like that or tried to do something like that? Is that ridiculous or is it just me? So, and then the Jews, the Pharisees, Council of Jamnia removed certain books from the Septuagint. And Justin the Martyr testifies of this. He's one of the early, very early Christians, church fathers. Uh, I think he's like 160 AD, somewhere around there. Um, some of the other ones also indicate this too, that uh, these Pharisees removed the books from the Septuagint. And so it was first, you can see, it's, it's, it's the mantle being tr uh, passed from the Pharisee to the, to the Pharisee in the church. And let me show you something here. This is really interesting. I want to show you a parallel. This is from John 5, verse 38 through 40. Jesus is speaking, And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent 
him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees here. He's saying that they think they have salvation, eternal life, through the scriptures. Now, it's these same people in the church who do the same thing. They say that their salvation is through the scriptures. That if you just have faith, you will be saved. As if faith doesn't have anything to do with living faith. It has nothing to do with repentance. It doesn't have anything to do with commitment. It doesn't have anything to do with you being married to Christ. Uh, you don't have to live right. Just do whatever you want. These people use the scriptures to claim that they have eternal life through these scriptures. They also, and we're talking Cal some of these type of Calvinists here, they also tell you that it's better to read the Bible than to pray, to understand the Bible. They actually do preach this way. I find that very interesting because it says the Holy Spirit teaches you all things. And they're telling you to read the Bible instead of praying. And here's the thing. They translated the Bible to fit their theology. The English Bibles are translated badly to fit their theology. So it's like they're saying, don't trust the Holy Spirit, trust us. We translated it right. We're Sola Scriptura. You don't need any more books, even though the books were removed from the, from the Old Testament. The King James Bible printed 200 years ago had the Apocrypha in it. It doesn't anymore. Why? Because Sola Scriptura. Because these Calvinists say that in you know, their Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, we, we don't need those books. Those are spurious. The book of Enoch is not written by Enoch. You see, what does this prove to you? It proves that they are carnal, that they are not Christian. And even their theology says they're carnal. Because they, they say that you only need to have Jesus as your Savior, not as your Lord. They're actually carnal people. They're no better than a non-believer with this theology. And the same is the case with a lot of these other guys. It says they run after two things, money, or, or they, they want to kill the person that's pre preaching the truth. What did Rome do? It wanted to kill Christians. What do, what do these prosperity preachers do on TV? They want you to they want your money. It's not about God. It's all about selfishness. Okay, so if it's a selfish gospel, it's not of God. Okay, so what I'm saying here is the church has done the same sin that the Pharisees did. They didn't accept certain books of the Bible. They only accepted 24. Okay, and uh, a lot of people don't even know that. Uh, and then they, they tried to remove books, like I said, from the Old Testament at the Council of Jamnia, AD 90. And then the church followed suit later on, 350 some AD, 4th century. That's when the church started following suit as well, showing that carnal men are in charge of the church. But see, Jude and P Peter warn us against these guys and tell us to contend for the faith and not to forget this book of Enoch and the Assumption of Moses and these other books like Ahakar which is an ancient wisdom book like Proverbs. So, actually, you want you, you should check out this Ahikar book. Just A-H-I-K-A-R. Go look that puppy up, man. Read it. You'll be shocked. I was reading through it, and I was like, it sounded just like some of the stuff Jesus said. There's a lot of stuff in it. You know the, the, the tree that uh, wasn't pr producing any fruit, and he said, give it a few years, and then uh, let's see if it produces fruit? That parable, that's from the book of Agakar. I'm pretty sure of it because he says the exact same type of thing. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the book of Agakar that sound like things Jesus said. So I'm sure Jesus read it. Okay? Because a lot of the stuff he says sounds a lot like it. Uh, more so than a lot of other books of, of, of Proverbs or other books in the Bible. So, And it's not even in the Bible, you see what I mean? <laughs> so, something to check out. At any rate, thanks for watching.